All right, so it's 34, so I want to get started. So yes, please listen. Um, I want you to go ahead and pull your sketchbook out. Go to the back of it, right? I see a lot of you are putting your notes and stuff like in between your sketchbook assignments. It's a lot easier for me if you stick that stuff in the back. That way, when I'm looking at your sketchbook assignments, I don't have to flip through that stuff, okay? Um, so let's take a fast look at this drawing one portfolio requirement thing, right? What we're doing today is number seven. I tried to put some weeks on there to help you understand the progress, kind of how we're going to be going. Um, but you'll also notice that we're skipping over positive space evaluation in so far that most of you have either started or drawn your negative space evaluation, which is number what? Five, okay? Your positive space is just a flip of that, right? So I feel like it's more important to jump into this shape analysis thing because it's a lot more complicated. It's gonna take a lot more of your attention and time today. However, Friday, we can come back and get these things inked in, right? And if you haven't started working on your positive space, you want to. And when you're doing that, you're not evaluating negative space at all. You're looking exactly at your subject in front of you and you're drawing it with the best likeness that you can. Sometimes when you put objects in front of a window, it's harder for the positive space evaluation because you're not seeing it so much, right? Like it's a silhouette or you don't have a lot of information about the positive space. It would probably be easier for you to put it in front of the blackboard or to put it in front of like uh, this cork board or something that's dark so that you are looking at your positive space more than your negative space, right? Um, so these examples over here, I still haven't erased my line work off, but when you have those in your sketch or in your portfolio rather, you will want to have just ink on the surface of these, right? So on positive space, can you all see this? So it might be kind of difficult for some of you over here, so you might want to take a look at it. Um, all you're leaving white is going to be that positive space to show your evaluation of it, right? You're going to blacken out the negative space completely, not important. Flip side on this one, right? Because what I'm looking for is how you employed or how you saw those puzzle pieces, so to speak, that connect the positive to the negative, right? Some of you will find that one is easier than the other. Um, if you found a pretty good time, good success with doing like gesture drawing and mass drawing, and some of the beginning stuff that we were doing like the first week of class, then you're probably gonna be like, okay, I'm just gonna revert to positive space thinking, and that's fine, right? For me, I find negative space thinking to help me a lot with proportion, to help me a lot with really complex forms that have a lot of um, interior portions to them. So again, this is more or less to show me that you practice the techniques, they're either there or they're not, right? Pass or fail. Um, in the end, I'm not going to say, you must do this when we're drawing, right, after midterm. Because you have all the choices that you need at that point. Okay, going back to viewfinder, right? Um, so that was last week, so number four on that. And you'll see that I put like an upside down drawing alternate out there. Don't worry about that. That's for my online students, okay? It's really hard for me to demonstrate the viewfinder thing and get that to my online students with fidelity. Um, it's much easier for us to do this here, okay? So the viewfinder drawing with pencil siding and proportion, that, that was when we set up the still life up here, or I think you all actually set up still lives over here, and you use your viewfinders to get that proportionally larger on your paper, right? We use basic units of measure, that kind of thing. You'll wanna have your stuff drawn out with pretty high fidelity, okay? So your thing should look um, pretty well drawn. So Kate, yours looked good. You shaded everything out. That's all I need for that. Just make sure that you label it that. Um, you probably remember the continuous edge drawing, faces and vases, blind contour, mass and gesture. Now, we had not made our portfolios when we did the blind contour, mass and gesture. I have all those drawings still, okay? So we'll break those out here probably next week and make sure that you have everything that you need in your, in your uh, portfolio as such. Okay, cool. So next week we're jumping into one and two point perspective practice and application. After that, we do 50 boxes. So you're going to discover that things are going to rapidly pick up pace because we got to get this stuff done before midterm so that we're not worrying about technical stuff anymore at that point. And you're applying these techniques in the manner that you find to be the best, right? Okay. So today I'm talking about shape analysis. Um, the first slide has some 
imagery on there that I do want you to draw out to the best of your ability. So, and I know this is basic stuff, right? <clears throat> but essentially what I'm discussing here with circles, cylinders, cones, triangles, boxes, squares, um, these basic shapes are what we use to break down much more complex forms, right? So go ahead and get these sketched out in your sketchbook. Um, we'll also use more irregular polygons and shapes and forms, right? Today, we're just gonna focus on flat shape use. We may use some cylinders. We may use some, some boxes, just depending on what subject you choose, right? <clears throat> Not every shape and form is going to be right for every subject. So this is a method that I use a lot even today. Um, I think that some of you or a lot of you will actually find a pretty, a pretty good technique in this method um, that will help you to get very difficult forms to look objective, right? And there's more than this, obviously. <clears throat> but taking the shapes translating them more into forms by using some perspectival action in there, right? Now, you're not going to be shading these shapes or forms necessarily when we start to apply those to your chosen subject. We're just going to use them for planning purposes, right? Um, so more or less what I'm wanting you to do is get that shape to form translation happening here. So get yourself a circle, square, triangle, and then turn them into prisms, more or less. I do want you to go ahead and draw in the cylinder because we're gonna be practicing a lot of cylindrical um, forms because that's something that we use a lot when we're using um, basic shape analysis for human beings, right? So like when I have an arm that's going up and away like this, I'm gonna use a cylinder that has some sort of perspective or foreshortening to it rather than just drawing like a, a, a rectangle, right? Um, so, don't spend a huge amount of time on this, but have these basic shapes in their, in their form connections in your sketchbook, right? Then I'm gonna show you some examples <clears throat> of how artists have used these things to break down very com complex subjects. So, we use this for foreshortening a lot because foreshortening is very difficult. How many of you felt like you were really stressed out trying to draw your hand because it was so foreshortened, right? Like this? It's okay to say yeah. I get stressed out when I do that. It's hard because we want to make those fingers look like they're coming at the viewer while at the same time retaining some semblance of objectivity, right? And it changes from like a flat hand. So a lot of times when you're looking at that stuff, it's like, oh, it doesn't look right. Well, that's because it's not a flat hand, right? The forms are changing. They're warping as they come toward you or away from you. So this technique is really great for foreshortening. Okay, so simple shapes and their form pairs. I can go back to that if you need later, right? Really basic example here <clears throat> of how we can take something that would be considered a complex form like this flamingo and start to break that into smaller bite-sized pieces of shapes, right? Um, so you're gonna get a photograph today. I have a lot of different photographs to choose from and they all have complex form in some way, shape, or form. So like, I don't have any robins, like a bird that's just like, eh, you know, it would be a circle and an oval, great job, okay? It's gonna be a lot more difficult than that. But looking at how, looking at how the artist have done, has dealt with a more complex form, like with an oval here, sort of a triangle here, a small rectangle, a longer rectangle, those kind of things, um, and then translating that into a basic diagram, we're actually gonna make thumbnails this way, then we're gonna go into an actual more objective view of, of, that, of that subject. Um, you may get to shading today, I'm not sure. We'll just see how long it takes, right? So all the subjects that I've selected either have a lot of foreshortening in them or they are complex subjects that have this necessity for a lot of different shapes to be used. Now we're gonna move into next week with geometric analysis where we don't wanna think so much about shapes. We wanna think more about forms. We wanna think about like this wedge shape thing that would be you know, like a triangle that has 
extra sides to it and looks perspectival. Um, same with the cylinder. The cylinders will probably use quite a bit because they're really excellent for the description of rounded out things. And then we're gonna do things like what you see on the hindquarters here, where we'll start to modify those shapes. That kind of looks like a loaf of bread to me with something kind of sliced out of it, right? Um, so my hope is that you'll get to the point to where this is really second nature. Seeing this application in a lot of dynamic imagery, like you know this puma or cheetah or whatever that's in like full sprint, um, looking at something that's three quarter or a situation where we have this dog looking at us and the body's moving away. If we just look at that because of its contour and we try to go positive negative space, that's gonna be a lot harder than if we try to take those shapes and those forms and attribute those to different areas. Um, so we'll start doing studies and things like this. I actually pulled this off of Instagram Pretty sure they weren't very happy about that because then they made me sign in after that. And I was like, oh, I just wanted to screenshot it all. Um, but there's beautiful, beautiful examples on Instagram of, uh, like I follow a whole bunch of academic drawing um, artists and just using, <clears throat> you know, things like this cone and then an inverted cone on top and then practicing the different textures that you see down here. Thinking about taking that shape, laying it on its side, creating ellipses to kind of give it a scaffolding as it goes around. So these things help a lot. Now dealing with the human form. A human form is really dynamic and very difficult to work with, right? So this is really, this really simplifies drawing figures. Um, if you know how to take different aspects of the human figure and apply these kind of, um, um, dimensional forms to it. Again, with foreshortening, like we see up in this upper left-hand corner, um, we can't look at the calf for what a calf normally looks like. We have to look at the shape that happens in there. We have to look at how that, the ball of that foot is coming straight at us. And by piling these shapes together, we can get something that's going to look a lot more objective. Um, when we get into gesture drawing and line of action drawing with the figure drawing unit, We'll be doing a lot of this kind of analysis that you see over here on the right as well. So hands, right? Hands and arms. Very difficult, I think, to draw. But again, if you break them down into these simple sort of cylinders, even the fingers, right? Smaller cylinders working together, um, using kind of like a rectangular prism for the top of the hand and then working our fingers off of that is extremely helpful. Okay, foreshortening. So, this is good to get in your sketchbook for that quiz, that midterm quiz. Remember, it's open book. So you're portraying or showing something that's closer than it is or it's having less depth or distance. In some way, the form that you're looking at has been angled in such a manner that the forms either pile up on one another or the perceived width or mass of that form changes as it goes back into space or toward you, the viewer, right? Um, so this little study of the bottle over here, I think is a really great illustration of how that works. How we take something like this, but then when we apply a rectangular prism to it that actually has perspective to it, and then we draw that in space, we can create something that's a lot more realistic as such. A lot of times when students don't understand foreshortening, I see like really weird bulky flat drawings or things where certain parts of the anatomy are pretty clearly um, incorrect. So these techniques are gonna help you quite a bit.